You're listening to Word Slinger Podcast episode 032. Ah, Word Slick. Ah, let me start again. You're listening to the Word Slinger Podcast episode 032, Conceptual Podcasting with the Art Guys. Most edited podcast ever. Writing is difficult, but it is worth the effort. Kevin Tomlinson can help you develop a daily writing habit that will let you write your book, improve your website, and build or grow your business. Visit kevintumlinson.com and start writing now. It's the Word Slinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand, write your book, redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours? Now, here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tumlinson, the Word Slinger. Word Slinger. Hey everybody, this is Kevin Thomason, the Word Slinger, and uh, this is a very special episode because this is officially, and I mentioned this somewhere along the way in the podcast, but this is officially the single most edited episode of the Word Slinger podcast there has ever been. Um, and those of you who have listened for a while, you probably realize that I don't, I don't typically edit um, the interviews. Because, for one, I don't, I, I'm lazy, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't want to spend that kind of time on it. But also, uh, I like the authenticity of the interviews. I like, you know, I like the flubs. I like when there's, you know, some some reality intruding on uh, this little bubble of uh, fantasy that we've created here <laughs> that is the Word Slinger podcast. And I like the uh, sort of authenticity of the whole thing. So, um, even like the uh, microphone stand sound you just heard as I moved it around. So sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of edit in, uh, in this episode, mostly because when we, uh, were talking, they were talking to me on a, uh, a mobile phone, their iPhone, uh, on Skype and it sounded fine, but we kept getting disconnected because of their Wi-Fi or the, the, uh, cellular signal dropped out or, or whatever. So, um, you know, and eventually we just switched mediums all together and we're talking on a landline phone. Um, you know, and they called in, so kind of a mess, but it serves a purpose overall. Uh, kind of, it was interesting the way it, cause listening back to the whole thing, uh, as I was editing, it really, uh, it worked. I mean, for, for what these guys do. Okay. So the guests I have on this week are the art guys and they are, um, uh, these conceptual artists who live and work here in Houston, they do a lot of work um, all over the place, really. But they're really well known here. Um, again, the mic, the mic arm. I'm just trying to get it in a better position. I'm, I swear. Um, but they do a lot of work here, and it's really cool stuff. I mean, some of it's just you know, it feels bizarre. It's out there, um, as as uh, Michael puts it in his in one of his comments that there's something strangely right about the wrongness that they do. And, uh, that's probably my favorite quote from the whole interview. And it's, um, it is like that. It's things like wearing a suit for a year that has, uh, you know, logos on it, you know, a sponsored outfit for a year and, um, you know, wearing, uh, buckets of water on your feet as you walk around downtown, things like that. It's, it, it's, it serves a purpose, though you may not always know what the purpose is. It's it's just this kind of commentary on the world, and uh, a different way, a different perspective, a different way to look at the world. So that's that's what the uh, that's what their work is about. It ended up being kind of what the podcast itself was about. <laughs> um, it was like a conceptual art piece all on its own. As I started trying to pull the whole thing together, so. Um, in this interview, you're going to learn a lot about what these guys do, and I hope it kind of opens you up to uh, the idea of experimentation. Um, because they call themselves the art guys, but they don't necessarily consider themselves artists, which I thought was interesting. Um, art becomes the catch-all term for the kind of thing they do. They're not they're not marketers either, uh, in their estimate. Um, they what they do has a component of marketing, just like anything. But uh, they've created something all, all on its own. And I would say that if you are someone who's creating a business around um, your, you know, your specialized knowledge or skill um, or your passion or your expertise, you know, this is a good model to follow because they go out. A lot of times what you hear, the advice you hear is, you know, go find a market and then create for that market. And I think that's smart. And if your goal is I want to build a successful business, um, 
that makes money, makes an income, etc. Uh, you know, that's really the smartest way to go about it. But what these guys do is sometimes go out and create things, whether there's a market for it or not. And they uh, then they go find the market, which is completely backwards, and it's harder. And I think it's that it's that difficulty actually that makes it kind of appealing to the guys. It's the challenge of it. And I would say that despite all the great advice you get from from entrepreneurs and coaches and um, mentors, despite the advice that you know the smart move is go find the market and then build the product, that is brilliant advice. But despite that. There is a time in your life where it's okay to go invent that new thing and then go then go find the people who appreciate it. Sometimes you do things just because you love it and you do things just because you're passionate about it. And um, you want to go off and you want to go out in the world and see if you can find kindred spirits or people who can at least catch a glimpse of what you tried to do there and, and appreciate it. So, you know, that's what a lot of authors do. Um, Sometimes you just got to write the book, whether it's going to sell or not. I know so many, a lot of authors I talk to, a lot of my clients, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, friends who are authors, uh, people in my mastermind groups, a lot of us, me included, we, we write books just because we love the, the story. Uh, we want to tell that story. It has to be told. If we never sell a copy, it's kind of sad um, at times, especially when we, are, we kind of pin our dreams on that work. But sometimes you just gotta you just gotta produce, <laughs> and that's what this is all about. So uh, I'm gonna roll you right into the interview, and then stay tuned after. I got more questions. Um, it looks like somebody started a trend last week, so I've got um, two more questions this week. Um, one of them in particular is a is a favorite, even though they misspelled um, a, a critical word in the sentence, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, stay stick around, hear the answers to those questions. And for now, go tune in and listen to a great but highly edited interview with the art guys. See you after the break. Hey, everybody. We are today, I'm here with uh, the art guys. And that is Michael Galbraith and Jack Massing. And they are local to me. Uh, They may not be local to you, but here in the Houston area, they're kind of very well known. You guys actually have a big national reach, though. I mean, you're all over the place, right? Well, at times we are, yeah, but I mean, we're based here in Houston. Yeah. So real quick for everybody listening, because I know it'll get confusing. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves so they can identify your voices? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, this is Jack Massing. Um, this is my voice, and I'm going to use it. All right. <laughs> and Michael? And this other voice is Michael Galbraith, and this is what I sound like. All right. Thanks for uh, being on the show, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, so why don't we start by just, you know, now it, here's what's interesting, and I, I everyone can see this as they go on their site, and your your website is theartguys.com. Um, I, I checked out your bio and everything, and I love the two quotes that you guys chose to put on your uh, bio page there, the about page. <laughs> um, and the first refers to you guys as conceptual artists of the highest order, but I love the second one that says that you are exemplary figures of the idiot loser class and that they, you made this person sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which of those is the, the uh, role you guys aspire to? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know that um, we aspire to either one of those. <laughs> those are just uh, other people's reactions. Um, in the alpha and omega. Yeah. People's reactions toward us. We like them both. Yeah. For, for different reasons. <laughs> so, um, why don't you tell us a little about what you guys do in particular? Like, how would you describe yourselves? Well, I think in general we're visual artists. I mean, it's. It's really hard to um, sort of put things in the proper box, as yeah. it were. Yeah. But we do work um, generally with the, mat- the material of the world, the greater world. But we, I guess, process it through what would be considered an art practice because mm-hmm. we went to school for art. And as we age and as we work, we find it more and more difficult to identify as an artist because we just generally work in the world um so our vocation i guess is a little bit different than how we think but we do primarily work within the confines of the art world in general 
Now, are you guys doing this? This is full time for the two of you, right? Yeah. So what's a what's a typical work day for an art guy? Well, it's sort of coming into the studio. Um, we primarily work in the office, which is where we're talking to you from. Okay. And we work on the computers and plan things. And then the studio, which is just downstairs, we will go down there and fabricate or create things. Um, but our days are very different. You know, we never quite know exactly what we're doing from one day to the next. And when there's multiple projects that we're pursuing or that we're working on, you know, we could be going downtown for something or we could be um, getting on an airplane to go somewhere. So it's, it's always changing. Yeah. So um, what are some of the projects that you've, that you're most known for? Well, that's, that's hard to say. We've, we've been working for more than 30 years. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's hard to, I'm not exactly sure uh, what people think of or remember us about. Um, we can talk about some things that may have uh, had a broader reach in the public sphere. Sure. Because they were, because they were designed to. Yeah. Um, and many people who are younger may not know anything about what we did 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, the one work that we did to give you an example as far as working in the public sphere is a, a work that we called Suits, The Clothes Make the Man, mm -hmm. in which we uh, had fabricated uh, two uh, suits, men's uh, dress suits. Uh, they were designed by a designer, Todd Oldham. And then on these suits, on the surface of the suits, we leased advertising space to uh, various companies. And then we wore these suits as a sort of walking, talking uh, billboards. We wore these suits for a year. Uh, the One of the goals of that piece was to be as public as possible, uh, thereby um, uh, answering the needs uh, and the agreement with the different companies. Yeah. Um, so that, that piece was very well known. We were seen all over the world in all different media, uh, television, radio, print media, all the major publications, almost anything you can name, CBS, CNN, um, as far as television, all the many local TV stations, uh, the, uh, many newspapers, magazines, and what have you. So that piece was designed to be a, a public piece because it was about media and marketing and advertising. Right. But then we've, we've done many pieces that uh, maybe only one or two people know about, if that many. Well, here in Houston, we have um, one piece in particular that stood out. It was called um, the, the Absolute Billboard or Absolute Art Guys. And mm -hmm. Absolute commissioned us to design and make a billboard and we chose to uh, paint a billboard every day with a thousand coats of paint over about a nine month period. And that billboard was over by the Galleria, the 610 loop yeah. on the west side, which is one of the most busiest parts of highway in the entire state. So um, for it to be there for so long and to be in that location, a lot of people saw it. Yeah. So oftentimes when we're out and about, and we're having a discussion with someone who asks that question, like, well, what do you do? And then we tell them and they don't know what that is. And then we say, well, we did a billboard out on, you know, Loop 610. And then they remember that. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the ones I remember, actually. Yeah, yeah. So just because it was so visible and, and out for so long and, and it was so great. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So we're, okay. I don't, I don't want to fall back on cheesy questions. Like, I don't want to ask you where your ideas come from necessarily. But, I mean, you have to take inspiration from somewhere. So do you guys do sort of a – on your site, I think you refer to yourselves as a think tank, right? So you sit and brainstorm these plans and, you know, yeah. sort of plans for art domination? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think what happens with anyone, really, whether you're a chef or a school teacher or a scientist – you pretty much process the information that you learn. Mm -hmm. And we both went to art school and we've been involved in handling the media of art. So 
by default, we distill a lot of those ideas through that. However, while we do that, we're also cognizant and aware of the art world, and we try not to mimic it or try not necessarily to, um, not necessarily mimic, but um, buy into a lot of the conventions that are there. We try to become, you know, somewhat unconventional even within the art world, which is pretty broadly based in terms of its idea base. There's millions of different artists doing millions of different things. So we have a tendency to try to go the opposite way of that. If I, if I could add to that and clarify, uh, I don't know that um, I'm, uh, I don't know that either of us are actually or have ever been that concerned with so-called art even as uh, much of experts we may be about it. The activities that we do is the method of working is to question those activities. That's not, and in my mind, it's not necessarily that we work in the conventions of art because these days, and really for almost forever, I've never really been that concerned with art except for that it's the closest perhaps definition for what it is that we do. And as I was saying that it's uh, the, whatever activities that we're up to, um, uh, you, you couldn't, well, you wouldn't necessarily call it sports or you wouldn't necessarily call it medicine or you might not call it uh, Something. You know, advertising. But in fact, the matter is, is that we have worked with all of those things, yeah. with all of those kind of um, you know, parameters or whatever you want to call those. Um, so it's, we, we continually work in a strange sort of, um, crossover world that has a lot of paradox built into it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Even the, even the very name, the art guys is, um, as pedestrian as it is and as goofball as it is, uh, I, d I don't necessarily, I, d I don't necessarily align us with the art world for sure. Because I, I find that world too, far too confining for many of the ideas that we have. And in fact, formally speaking, we don't work in the art world a lot of times because we don't present whatever it is that we do in those what, what might be thought of as normal modes of presentation like galleries or museums or anything. We certainly have done that. We certainly do do that. But I, I put all that stuff as equal footing to any place else on the surface of the earth. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it sounds like the same problem that a lot of people in the uh, creative industry sometimes have. Because there's a tendency, especially when you start working with agencies, to uh, to sort of silo you into you're a copywriter or you're, you're a uh, designer or you're a web developer. When these days I think that uh, people have skills that branch across a wide range of areas. So I think it's similar and maybe I'm off base. You let me know. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's, I think that's accurate. I think that, I, I think, uh, I think the people assign definitions to whatever in the world as a way of trying to come to terms with it in a certain sort of way. Yeah. So if people accuse us of being artists, that's fair enough. And that's part of our name. But that's almost a diversionary tactic. Yeah. Um, so again, we, you know, the very fabric of, of how we go about what we do is, you know, pair consistent, paradoxical nature built into it. Yeah. Which, and there are very few things in the world in the way of living one's life that do that. There, there are just not that many. Yeah. And it's not that we, it, and it's it's purposeful. It's almost as if we're seeking that in order to, you know, get at the thing that we're questioning. So it's in, that's interesting. And I I hadn't really thought about what you do as being that quite that, I guess, amorphous <laughs> uh, because art is so broad. Uh, it's it's another one of those broad terms, kind of like marketing in some ways. Uh, you know, people use the term marketing uh, to apply to all kinds of things, but it. I think it's everyone's attempt to narrow things down and label it. So, um, so how do you make something like that a business? You guys are basically pursuing a passion, right? And you you started in art school, um, and you've turned this into a business. How do you go from, 
you know, these sometimes crazy sounding ideas to having a business built around the whole idea? Well, um, I, I can speak to that a little bit in the way it functions, but um, maybe not in the way it, it really is. But let's say you're a gardener and you have a, a landscaping company and you start doing landscaping. Yeah. Well, if you do a good job, you're, by word of mouth, you're going to get more work. Yeah. And in a way, that's sort of what happens with our, I think, and I think it definitely happens with us, that um, we produce something interesting out and then we end up generating clients through simply through our work. Yeah. Now, those clients are, are much more widely varied than people that own property when concerning themselves with a landscaper. Um, so we're, we're working in universities and schools and uh, with collectors and with galleries and selling things ourselves and uh, doing performance work and all these different sort of venues and different with different clientele. Yeah. And one of the reasons why we struggle, I think, um, is due to the fact that we change what we do a lot. We're kind of always jumping around and doing different things, which makes it difficult for a homeowner to hire us to do their yard. Yeah. Because, you know, they might hire us and we'll like, okay, we're going to do the windows. But wait, you're a gardener. You yeah. know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. that analogy can be fit, can, can fit into sort of a greater understanding of how it works. If, if if I could elaborate further on that is that you you talking about the transition of going from you know so called student which I never considered myself and up, up till past high school um, if as far as making a business of of the so, of the so called thing and that would that would um, imply some sort of exchange, some sort of value exchange, right? For goods and services in exchange for money, right? Yeah, right. So it's sort of commodifying whatever it is that we do. And in your, in the beginning, you, you had quoted a, a New York Times uh, definition of us as conceptual artists. Then if you investigate the very term of that, that it's, it's concept-based or yeah. idea-based artists. And if the ideas that we have have some sort of value to them, then they're going to be desired. And I think it's pretty simple. It's almost a, a system of uh, reciprocal nature mm -hmm. um, that we're involved in. And uh, the, the, un the unfortunate factor is, is that there's a high degree of experiment that we do. <laughs> so the things that we do um, are not familiar to people. Right. And so there might be a hesitancy to involve themselves with it. But that's part of the game. It's fun. You know, that's, that's part of the deal. Well, you know, you're not alone in uh, in that, I think, as a concept. Because, you know, there are, there are businesses out there like IDEO that, you know, yeah. they do something sort of similar. I mean, they've, they've yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're all about, con you know, working on a concept and creating a, a prototype and that sort of thing is that would you say that's a fair like similarity or assessment of what you guys close think? enough it yeah. is but uh, um we have less um i mean if ideo gets a client that wants something they have kind of a structured goal yeah we're our own client in a way so we can't pay ourselves to do our ideas right um however we do you know i mean we do that all the time but the scale of which we work cannot compare to ideo if if our budget is tiny, so yeah, yeah, you know, and then if you if you engage with a university where you go onto the campus, let's say, and give a lecture and visit some studios and perhaps make a, an artwork for the campus, a temporary artwork, you know, you're not talking about a very large budget. So, the, a lot of the creativity goes into fitting the idea to the circumstance yeah. in those cases, and that's. Uh... That's some. That's the kind of creativity that most entrepreneurs have to <laughs> have yeah, to learn how to exercise. That have to yeah have to deal with. So, so you know, you know that that the term you just used, entrepreneur. I love that term. Yeah. I love the idea of it. I like the idea of its sort of inherent nature of being what many people would think of as American. 
Yeah. Um, that that is, um, you know, trying new things, doing new things, and uh, doing them in in uh, interesting ways. And I think there's a lot of comparisons to what we do as so-called artists with entrepreneurs. Uh, that's that's the, almost the very basis of, of our work. It's a, a very entrepreneurial. We do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, and if if you want to think about in terms of uh, research and development, that's all we do yeah. <laughs> uh, is research and development. And the the miraculous part of it is, as far as being, you know, again an artist, is that the materials that we use it's 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 almost making something out of nothing yeah as we our work is again conceptual meaning idea based so it, it most everything if you think about it with any company or any industry or whatever it starts with an idea yeah correct i mean where else is it going to start right yeah and then so we're we're at the forefront of that um, and I think that uh, most people that are, who are considered artists are also that way, um, the, the, the good ones, I think. Um, so anyway, that's that's the very fun part of it all, I think. Yeah, you know, I actually tell a lot of my clients and, and a lot of people I work with that um, basically all business is telepathy when you come down to it because it all yeah, starts with that that's idea. Exactly, that's exactly right. You're transmitting your ideas into other people's heads yeah right it is it that's exactly what it is and you do using different methodologies to do that that's that's a that's exactly what it is it is the telepathy uh so also, i meant to say <laughs> tel- <laughs> I a little bit of drinking before the show mike is that what i the... understood what you meant before you said it <laughs> I knew you would say that. Um, so I knew you'd say that. So about your clients, because uh, in a way it sounds like sometimes, sometimes what you guys do is sort of create the product before you actually have the market for it, right? I mean, you're, a lot of the time, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what about the clients? How do you end up, me? How do you end up uh, attracting clients then? Well, again, it kind of goes back to word of mouth, but yeah. then uh, we do market, you know, and part of part of just exhibiting work and getting, let's say, an article in the newspaper or having a website or giving a lecture um, in front of an audience, those are marketing tools, mm-hmm. all, all of them. And, um, you know, we have had affiliations with different commercial galleries in the past. We don't right now, but they end up doing some of the marketing for you, yeah. albeit pretty lame, but... We, uh, I, I shouldn't say that we, you know, we, we, we seem to do better job of marketing than most of the commercial galleries that we've worked with. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the most typical uh, structure that people think about in the way of getting the word out or getting the work out or distribution or however we were talking about just a minute ago, the structure of our world, generally speaking, uh, is that artists, make things yeah. uh, which could be called commodities right not yep. that much different and then they market them and then sell them right painting mm-hmm. sculpture things right yeah. then they have a what jack has referred to as, as as retail outlet which is the galleries right, right. in some ways museums right so that's a typical way that the the structure that artists have used in recent human history of of getting their work out into the world. Um, the art guys have uh, played with that very structure and investigated it on in many different ways, in many different levels. And in, in the case of the Seuss Project, for example, there's no separation between the presentation, the, the structure of, of the presentation, and the work itself. Does that make sense? They're one and yeah. the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that kind of makes me want to ask the question, you know, is there is there sort of an overall, I don't know, an overall idea or an overall message behind everything you're doing? Is there something that unifies everything? Not really. I mean, the what, one of the things that we like to talk about is that art does not have to have meaning. Okay. It doesn't 
have to be. That's going to shock a lot of people. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, and that's that's a tough one for some people to wrap their head around because conventionally, most people see art as a sculpture or a painting, right? You know, something that's on the wall or on the a shelf or a plinth, and you know, we agree that that's that can be art, but uh, our notion is that it's much different than that. And although we do make sculpture and we do make what would be considered wall art. Um, but for us, it goes w way beyond that. Yeah. So it's it, the conventional ideas uh, and the um, actually the education of the of, of people in the United States, does, they don't really get a, access to conceptual art so much uh, yeah. as they do in other places. Like certainly Europe has a much sort of better grasp in the population of what artists are and what they do. And I think in America, most people think that they're those people that make paintings and sell paintings. Right. I, th I think the nature of our work regarding meaning, um, we, we don't use um, what might be called the methodology of metaphor. In other words, we're not, if, if we're going to do a work, we're going to do something. Let's say... Did I lose you again? Or is this a really dramatic pause? Well, that, that, that's all I did is actually I was pausing for a very long time. Okay. So, in fact, you got it. I all think right. you got it all. It was that I was trying to be very dramatic. All right. So the pause <laughs> lasted for about a minute while we were cut off. And uh, that, was, that was what I was trying to uh, explain, exemplify the drama of the art guy's work. Okay. By having a very long pause. Excellent. <laughs> now, what, what I what I was going to say, if your question about meaning, generally speaking, the art guys uh, d d don't go about making work in a metaphorical way. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not going to do something and say we did this because it means that, right. or it stands for that. Um, and in fact, many of the things that we do. Might be think might be thought of as absurd or wrong-headed or there's something wrong with it. Yeah. Um, uh, and we, I, I would prefer just to let it stand on its own so that it becomes some sort of just simply experiential thing. But generally speaking, again, also get, getting back to your earlier question about what it is that we're doing and if it can be distilled into a singular thing. Uh, they, although there's paradox built into to, into this reply, perhaps um, is that we're we're just uh, doing everything, meaning yeah. we're figuring out the world. In a way, it's sort of a physical philosophy, mm -hmm. but it's more than that, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Because there's no there's no uh, on the surface d direct reason for doing something. Again, like walking around downtown with buckets of water attached to your feet, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's something strangely right about the wrongness of many of the things that we do, if that makes sense. I think I could probably get there. I, I, I think it's kind of like your art. There's you, you know, you, you, <laughs> you, you just have to see it. Yeah. Maybe we should pause again and be dramatic. <laughs> Maybe we should. What okay. uh, do you have any regular questions that we could answer that <laughs> have concrete answers? You know, I don't do regular concrete answer questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, I about the question like, how much money can you send us, or something like that. <laughs> okay, that, uh, would, that would that would be useful. To I us. would like answers to that question myself, to be frank. Yeah. Oh, I see. All right. Uh, so I can ask you why Houston, because uh, neither of you is from Houston originally, right? No, no, we're not. And and um, Michael, uh, his his story is that he was he was going to school up in at Middle Tennessee State, which mm -hmm. is now called something else, Actually, but Memphis. Memphis State. I'm sorry, he was going to Memphis State, and he was visited there. His art department was visited by a couple of artists from Houston, okay. who kind of sang the praises of the place, and they were interesting. Artists and he he followed them here after he was uh, done with school and went to graduate school at U of H, and I uh, moved down here essentially from Western New York uh, because my parents moved here and um, I ended up sticking around 
and going to U of H where I met Mike in the very early 80s. Yeah. And so what what got you guys together? Like, what made you guys decide to work together? Well, we, we were working on very similar things and similar materials in similar ways. So um, that kind of did it. And then we collaborated on these sort of projects uh, every quarter. Yeah. So every e- equinox and solstice, we, we collaborated on these projects and then um, started making objects and doing different things. We, we pretty much started out as um, kind of installation artists and then performance and then more object-based yeah. uh, collaborations. Um, so what would you guys say to this idea that, you know, because a lot of uh, people going into college especially get this, but um, there's a lot of emphasis on you should focus on something, specialize in one thing. Uh, what do you guys say to that idea? Well, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true anymore, although, you know, it it doesn't hurt at all to strengthen your strengths. Mm-hmm. So if you're a good writer, you know, you might as well, you know, work really hard at being a good writer and focus on that because pretty much after a while you'll be leading yourself everywhere else. But if, you know, if you're really poor at something, um, everybody has their own strengths. So if you're not very good at something, it's sort of futile to chase that yeah. unless you really want to be you know a supermodel you you know if you don't have that you got to get a bunch of facelifts or whatever i'm <laughs> just being funny here but you know what i'm saying yeah that, well i don't think that i don't think i think there's a mistaken perception regarding people who are who are are identified as artists and i i have come to realize that they're far fewer yeah. than than who are identified as such. They're, they're truly far fewer artists than people think there are. Um, and those people who are artists um, uh, don't become artists. They are. They are what they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just the way it is, not... Uh, uh, not to be all metaphysical about it, but it's a fact. You can fool the fans, but you can't fool the players. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. And but uh, you, the, you know, an artist is an artist, and and any amount of schooling is not going to make them, or not make them. Um, but regarding that, let's say employment in college and all that sort of stuff, we could go on and on about that. Yeah. But um, but generally speaking, I, I think the role what it is people like us who, who what we do is to um uh consider everything frankly mm-hmm. so okay so uh, someone goes to an art you know a lot of a lot of people who go to art school for example um they get a lot of grief from family or friends or whatever that tell them to go off and find something that that could be more stable and more lucrative i mean how do you how do you answer that <laughs> Well, I, I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the educational system here in the United States. And yeah. it, quite frankly, it should be the other way around because people that decide to be artists can do anything, yeah. really. And it, should, it shouldn't it should be that way. It should be more, it should be more that artists are, are, are paid well and praised and somehow supported, although... That's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> yeah. But if you want to, if you want to look at uh, our neighbor to the south, Cuba, you have a society there where artists are probably one of the best paid professions in that country. In fact, artists are paid better than doctors. So, oh. but that's just it. Just ended up being that way through, essentially through the communist sort of regime. But. Uh, artists in Cuba are highly regarded and thought of as very, very important people. That's interesting. I, 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 I can't come in that. I, I really don't know anything about it. But um, regarding, uh, let's say, colleges and education and, and people who run into issues with their family or, or expect that if they go to college that they're going to come out with a diploma that's going to get them employment. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I have a, a very perhaps old fashioned, but at the same time very forward thinking way of, of, of college education. 
I don't believe any of that nonsense. I don't believe that you go to college to get employment. I think that's just nonsense. Um, I think you go to college to think. You know, I don't think that if, if you're going to college to figure out what to think, you, you're, you've are you already lost. Yeah. I think the reason you go to college is, is to begin to learn how to think. You know, all through high school, you're taught what to think, right, and how to put two and two together. Right. But then in, I think by the time you get to college, it should be some critical thinking. Now, what Jack said is that, you know, if you get something like that, if you're lucky enough to have people who can, who can help you uh, learn how to think, then it, it, it almost doesn't matter what you do, right? right. So if, if, you're, if you're going to major in art, and I, I do have problems sometimes. I mean, you have to start somewhere, I guess, in university. They become like churches almost. They become like different de- denominations right. of one big religion. So university is a universe, right? Then, it, then they, they break it down into different sub-universes like uh, anthropology or business or... Or engineering or art for that matter mm-hmm. and I, I don't necessarily think that's the way the world is no right and um, so the kids who go in there and they're only going into classrooms in one building right just to take anthropology or something um, it's fairly limiting um, the, you know so I think that I, I, I think that the, the best use of that time in a young person's life should be dedicated to how to think, you yeah. know, analytical, critical thinking. And that's very difficult. I think it's very difficult. And I think it's extraordinarily valuable, as a matter of fact, because I don't, I don't see a lot of it in the business world. I think it could help anyone, right? Yeah. But if you, if you just yourself or name anyone out there who's listening, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, and we're definitely in a, uh, we're in an area of, uh, history i think where the entrepreneur is really starting to kind of come into his own where yeah people building authority businesses going out and uh creating work around their their expertise and around their passion so those critical thinking skills are invaluable at that point yeah absolutely and i think it, there's a whole number of things that are going on technologically speaking so that the uh, a, a lot of let's say like uh uh food processing, gathering and processing, Mm -hmm. or energy gathering and processing and distribution is done with a smaller and smaller amount of of humans, you know, and accomplishing much more, right? Right. So you don't need so many humans to make a car, for example, you know. You you need far fewer people because you have robots making them, frankly, right? right. right? So then then what that does in a sort of future shock kind of way is it really does give a lot of freedom to time uh, with, with people. Okay. That one said I was put on hold. Oh, uh, well, the, yeah, yeah. Phone <laughs> well, call we, came in and yeah, I just stopped we, it. We got bored with the conversation. So we put us all on hold. <laughs> that was another one of those. That was another variation of a very dramatic the, pause. I'm starting to think this whole podcast is actually one of your, uh, you know, one of your projects. And we're it, just... it is, as a matter of fact, it is. <laughs> it's audio art. It is. It's a conceptual podcast. <laughs> uh, I I want to go back a little bit here and talk about something that is a it's an intuitive notion, more or less, that I have about vocations and about education, especially higher education, it seems to me, and I may be wrong, but it seems to me that if you take a percentage of people that graduate from the arts, I'm going to throw everybody in there, actors and poets and musicians and artists and sculptors and painters and whoever, and you track their career path after school, you will probably see a higher incidence of people outside of their field of, of study, but highly functional and highly successful, yeah. let's say in an ad firm or on a, uh, a writer on a television show or all these other jobs that are sort of tangential to, but important for the arts. Uh, however, if you look at other vocations, let's say accounting, you're going to find people that are maybe not getting jobs in accounting, but rather than 
morphing into something else, they go back to school and take another job for another vocation. Right. And I think that's due in large part to the fact that the thinking that goes into the arts you know, is much broader and much more um, critical. Hello. Are you there? Yes. <laughs> this is. This is a regular telephone call. We we paused and switched mediums. All right. Uh, this is officially going to be the most edited episode I've ever had on the show. So. <laughs> I well, it, I'm I'm glad that we're the most of something. <laughs> you win. You win at being Why did edited. You drop it? I'm not you know entirely. No, actually, I think it's on your end. I know I never have dropouts, so I'm not entirely certain. <laughs> All right. Uh, so okay, yeah, and everyone listening has probably heard numerous little drops and pauses and uh, skips and we'll we'll uh we'll see if i can work all that out and edit but just in I think case we should include it in the program i think we for should the exact length of time that we were disconnected <laughs> so everybody will get the feel the same feeling yeah as I think, we did i think i should put like a, a whole just you know several minutes of static in between each each uh segment and then everyone yeah. can... <laughs> conceptual podcast. conceptual podcasting it'll be like richard nixon's case <laughs> exactly. Uh, so for those listening, that we've had to switch media because we kept uh, getting drops. But um, so uh, a couple of questions I wanted to ask, and we can kind of cap things off. But uh, uh, one thing I wanted to say earlier, uh, one of you mentioned, someone mentioned something that sparked this idea. But I think we're kind of in an age where artists are getting a lot more, we'll just say street cred uh, when it comes to the business world, because we've got fields like you know, user experience design and, you know, this whole idea of, of functional art. I mean, do you, do you see that being something kind of a positive turn in the industry? I don't know. I, I, I have a hard time, um, uh, getting a feel for overall tendencies. Mm -hmm. The world is so big and so scattered, uh, and it, everyone has the ability to see so much these days, right? right? So we so we know what's going on in Atlanta and Birmingham and you know Minneapolis and you know Timbuktu, really everywhere. So it's it's complicated thing. So you have a, 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 a again a much more complicated world. And then you because you have all these different people doing so many different kinds of things. I have a I have a hard time uh, summarizing it into you know, tendencies or what have you. Because as soon as I start trying to do that, then you you have someone else taking another path. Yeah. So then it ruins any kind of theories about that kind of thing that I've ever had. That's just my take on it. Yeah. Someone else might say, oh, well, you just don't get out in the world, but I don't think that's true. Uh, so what about failures? Have you guys had some, some failures in your work? No. <laughs> It's a loaded question. No, we're 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 extraordinarily successful. Everything we touch, <laughs> it makes a lot of money. So those of you who are listening, uh, give us a call or go to thearchives.com. We're we're extraordinarily successful. And it's much now. Yeah. <laughs> now, our yeah. whole our whole lives are based on failure. Yeah. What um what what you touch upon is a very interesting sort of topic or conversation for us and failure is an amazing power and, and, and powerful thing and it's a great teacher mm -hmm. um, but if you fail so much as humanity does is that success you lose uh, <laughs> I mean it's, it's a real conundrum because probably you know pe some people think progress is one thing and other people think that, no, that progress is actually not progress at all. It's going back, or it's not the right progress. Right. So it's really, really hard. I, I've, I've come to believe that failure is a condition of humanity, not necessarily a problem. Hey, Kevin, we don't, we don't like to say failure yeah. around here. Okay. We like to call it dropout. <laughs> dropout, okay. <laughs> and what does that mean? That means that sometimes you get disconnected. 
yeah, that's uh, that's I, I'm familiar with the concept. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you have a tangible hands-on experience. <laughs> I think I know why we had so much dropout. Oh yeah, I was connected to the um, the Wi-Fi with the Skype, and I think there's an uneven um, an uneven Wi-Fi signal here because of our phone service. Oh, I see. And it usually you usually don't see it when you're on a computer on the web, but when you're on a phone which needs constant connectivity, yeah. it, it, the dropout shows up. And I think that's probably a metaphor for something. Yeah, I think there's some poetry to that. There there's is. some poetry to that if we keep digging and just keep making it up. That's exactly right. Yeah, yes, uh, and thus uh, sums up years of art critics. Um, so. <laughs> What uh, what are you guys working on right now? I mean, anything uh, anything kind of big in the works? We have many things that we're working on. We work on things simultaneously all the time. We have an exhibition currently up downtown at One Allen Center. It's called the Tunnel of Love, and it's up till May. Sponsored by Arts Brookfield. That's right. Oh, okay. And then we we have a number of ongoing projects. A very big project that we've been working on for a number of years on the topic of, of selling and marketing. We're literally trying to sell ourselves. The piece called Forever Yours, and uh, the collector or buyer is able to literally buy us, uh-huh. our, our corpus, our body of work, by purchasing our cremated remains after we die. Interesting. Um, that's a piece we keep working on. And then there's a, a newer work that we're, we're trying to realize called Every Man a King. Um, that is uh, selecting a person from random from a city like Houston and then uh, uh, making those, that person into a, a monument. Um, there's many different, many different things we're working on simultaneously. Very cool. I like all that. I, I would like to be a monument. So if you... Um... I want to be less random about it. You may, uh, you may select a word slinger. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up before the universe decides to disconnect us one more time. But, uh, I really appreciate you guys coming on the show and I'm going to send everybody, and every, uh, anyone listening knows they can look into the show notes and see a link to your site at the art Is there anywhere else online where people can find you or see your work? That's the best place. It'll take you everywhere else. Okay. But right. if you do a general, if you do a general search, we show up in a lot of different places where we work, different universities, museums, and galleries. So it's all over the place. Okay. All right. Um, well, I wanted to ask you, since since you do podcasts and sure. stuff, what is Ira Glass like? Oh, he's a wonderful man, and he smells like Old yeah. Spice. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> let's, let's not talk when we disconnect. Let's not call it that we're disconnecting. Let's just call it a very dramatic pause. Yes, we're going we're gonna to dramatically pause for several months at a time. <laughs> I think I'd rather just drop out. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, go check these guys out at theartguys.com. You'll see their work. You can, you know, you can spot a lot of their stuff pops up around Houston all the time. So if you're in the Houston area, uh, keep your eyes open. And uh, thanks so much for being on the show, guys. And I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun despite the, the dropouts. Yeah. Uh, we're going to learn from those. You're very welcome, and thank you very much, too. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody, and we'll, I will wrap the show up with my usual wrapper, so see you in a few minutes. And otherwise, thank you, Art Guys, and we'll see everyone else next week. Thank you, Art Slinger. All right, that was the Art Guys, and uh, they are swell guys, actually. I really enjoy talking to them um, over and over and over again. We did... I, I can't, I, I, we did at least 10 takes. Um, that's how many, I, that's how many audio tracks I had to edit, uh, to put that together. And I think it came together pretty well. And I know there's probably some pauses in there that may have annoyed some people and, uh, you know what? Yeah, you'll be all right. Uh, <laughs> it was just fun. Uh, that was a lot of fun. So, um, those guys, I love their take on things. I love the fact that, um, the whole world is art to those guys. And, and well, and maybe that's a misnomer because, you know, the, the whole contention over art really. Um, but, uh, over the definition of art, I guess, and whether or not they're actually artists by their own consideration, but, uh, they are 
creators, if nothing else, and they're, they're entrepreneurs. I mean, they're, they have found a way to make this, this work pay uh, for, their, for their lives, and uh, they're doing very well. And they, they, ha- they are authorities on this type of work. You know, they are authorities on art and, uh, or conceptual art at the very least. And, um, you know, they're amazing. So if you get a chance, check out some of their work, and you can go on their website, uh, which is theartguys.com. And, uh, you know, go uh, say hello and, uh, and uh, connect with them, spend a little time with them, and you'll be able to find uh, their, that website in the show notes. So, um, you know, they had some uh, reviews. I, didn't, um, I think I read some in the show. I did read some in the show, but the, the one from Houston Press, the art guys are exemplary figures of the idiot loser class. The art guys make me sick. <laughs> from 1995, which is hilarious. Uh, but then, you know, race forward to 2013 and the New York Times says the art guys are conceptual artists of the highest order. And I happen to agree. So um, thanks a lot, art guys, if you're listening, for tuning into that. Now, I wanted to get to, I have a couple of questions this week, which I'm really happy to have. <clears throat> and one of them comes from Josh Barrett here, right here in Houston. Uh, a, a neighbor, Josh Burrett. Is it Burrett? I'm sorry, Josh, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Josh Burrett of Houston, Texas. He says, what exactly is a wordlinger? <laughs> and I assume he meant wordslinger. <laughs> um, and if you're asking about a, a word, a wordlinger is a completely different thing. Um, and I'll do a whole show on that someday, maybe. But a wordslinger, which is what uh, the title I go by in the name of this podcast, um, that's a title I took uh, several years ago. Um, it kind of started, uh, I was at an ad agency that I will not name, um, and they were kind enough to let everybody choose their own titles, and there were some pretty good ones going around, and um, I, I, I didn't really struggle, I kind of went through a few iterations of what I wanted to uh, call myself, and I kind of, I'll be honest, I'm a fan of uh, Spider-Man, who is the web slinger, and I've sort of inadvertently said that a few times here on the podcast. If you listen closely, we'll call it an Easter egg. <laughs> so um, I got that. And then there was this concept of um, a gunslinger, you know, somebody who uh, in in popular American culture, you know, a gunslinger is probably nothing like a, a real gunslinger was. But, you know, there's this idea of this maverick moving from place to place. And, you know, uh, he's you don't know, uh, he's kind of on the line between good, good and bad, good and evil, I guess. Black hat, white hat. I'm sorry for the mic. I don't know what's going on with the mic stand thing today. Hear that? All right. It's like music. That's the soundtrack of the word slinger podcast. Sorry about that. That's quality. Um, but this idea of, you know, somebody who, uh, goes along, uses his tool of choice in this, in that case, it's a gun, um, to, uh, you know, kind of stand up for the little guy and, uh, live, uh, live by his own terms, which is really uh, what appealed to me. So a word slinger is someone who goes and does that with words and language. And, uh, that's, that's what I've been doing for my entire career. Uh, I'm, I'm living a life, uh, structured around that idea that, you know, I can use something I'm passionate about to make my, not only make my living, but help people. That's, that's the, uh, that really is the point. I want to help as many people as I can. I, I believe in that Zig Ziglar principle of, you know, you can, you can have anything you want in life if you're willing to help enough other people get what they want. Um, and uh, that's that's what a wordslinger is. Wordslinger is somebody who, uh, wordslinger, for, first of all, is me. <laughs> and uh, the, a wordslinger is somebody who uh, uses the craft of writing to go off and, and uh, not only better his own life, but to better, better the lives of others and to teach others and to help, you know, people, uh, get better at, at what they do and follow their passions and live the kind of life they want to live. So, uh, that's what a word singer is in a nutshell. And I could do a whole Austin Powers, you know, how did I get in this bloody big nutshell? I could do that, but I won't because you didn't ask for that. So, um, the next question comes from Brandon. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brandon. I'm going to butcher your name right now. Brandon Kualich, Kual, Kualich. And didn't give a location, um, so sorry. Wherever you are in the world, Brandon, I apologize for um, butchering your last name. Uh, but the question is, can you really write a book in 30 days? How? And that's one of those, like, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark uh, questions. 
<laughs> because I do know, I realize that that sounds pretty shocking um, to some people, but yeah, it's true. You can actually write a book in 30 days. And I, uh, I work with clients, uh, you know, to kind of figure out ways to do this. And there's more than one way. Um, I mean, for one, write shorter books if you want. I mean, you could write, someone asked me recently, um, how do you write 10 books a month? I don't actually write 10 books a month. And now I can produce 10 books a month if I have to. And the way to do that is first write very short books. <laughs> then, uh, and, uh, you know, draw from the material you already have. Um, so that's possible. But to write a, a book in 30 days, which is entirely possible and uh, something I do regularly, um, I use a formula and you know, I wish I would I'm such a dunce. I did not bring it up. Uh, so I'll try to do that now, but, um, because it's easier for me to read the formula <laughs> and when I'm talking to people about it, it seems to go a little smoother, but, um, here, let me search for it real quick. That way I can speak with authority because that's, uh, that's the whole idea. So my, uh, my formula for writing a book in 30 days, here it goes. I'm going to give it to you right now. So um, I use, I kind of refer to this as my sit your butt in a chair every day formula because <laughs> that's the key component is coming back every day to this. Uh, but here's what I recommend. I, I have a formula that goes um, total word target divided by total, um, di- divided by target days um, to completion, sorry, fumbling there. My context just drifted. (laughs) Typical. So total word target divided by target days to completion. So that would be TWT TWT over TDC, right? And your TDC is also known as your deadline. Uh, If you divide that, you'll get your total daily target, and that is your TDT. So it's TWT over TDC equals TDT. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, maybe I should put that in the show notes, who knows? But, uh, if you do that and let's say that you set a, now there are some assumptions you'll have to make. Most people want to aim for a book that's at least 50,000 words. To me, that seems like a good minimum for a book. There is no real set, you know, you, a book can be, really be any length to be, uh, very honest about it. You can, you can write a book that's a, only a few pages long. Um, and, uh, you know, the expectations of the reader may impact, whether or not it's considered a book by some, but you can you can call anything you want a book. So, uh, I mean, that's just the nature of books now. <clears throat> but if you have a book that is, uh, your target is going to be 50,000 words, which is a decent number of words, um, that puts you at around 200 pages in a, in a uh, six by nine trade paperback. It's like 196 or something. Um, so 50,000 words, and you want to write that in 30 days. We already know the 30 day goal, but you can make that any amount of time you want. If you want to do 60, 90, whatever, you just change that variable um, as the TDC. So you want to write 50,000 words in 30 days, and that comes to, um, it's a little over 1,600 words a day. And that's if you write every single day of the week, which I actually recommend if you can, uh, and you can, come on, you can get up a little earlier if you have to or whatever, but you know, there's always a way. If you're, if, if this is something you want, you're going to find a way to do it. And, uh, my recommendation is write every day because it builds a habit faster, makes you better at it. But you can write, you know, it really comes out to, it's over, I say over 1,600 words, nearly 1,700 words a day. Um, but I tell people all the time, you know, const- try to do at least 1,000 words a day. And um, I just interviewed Sean Platt from the self-publishing podcast and Sterling and Stone. And I'm doing a whole uh copywriting uh, project, uh, something that centers around copywriting. And that was his, you know, advice is he, he commits, he, he has committed to writing a thousand words a day. If you do that, let's just say you wrote a thousand words a day. Well, that's, um, uh, what, uh, 30,000 words a month. That's you're, you're more than halfway to a book, right? In one month. And then, uh, so in two months, you've got a 60,000 word book and that's, you know, that's our established, that's over our sort of established minimum of, uh, of work count for a book, um, you know, and do that for three months and you've got nearly a hundred thousand words. And, you know, that's what most people consider a a good book length. So that puts you in the the, uh, 300 page ish area. That's just with writing a thousand 
uh, words a month, uh, a, a day. <laughs> a thousand words a month will get you practically nowhere, but a thousand words a day, every day of the week, will get you a book every 90 days, which means that, you know, you can write a, at least three books a year. So that's how it works. I mean, and the more words you can turn out, the better. Um, if you only want to write on weekdays, then you uh, you ha basically have to, uh, your um, TDC becomes 22 instead of 30 because you're losing eight weekend days. So at that point, it would be 50,000 words divided by 22, which comes out to about um, 2,300 words a day. Uh, what I'd say is go ahead and shoot, if you're going to do that, shoot for 3,000 words a day because you'll actually knock out a book in 16 days if you do that. And if you can do 2,200, you can do 3,000. I mean, I, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> so, uh, and I tell people, I tell clients, the way to do this is to break it up. So get up in the morning and write 1,500 words. That's about four to five pages of, of writing. Um, and then, you know, go off to work or go, you know, ride your bike or go, uh, you know, do laundry or whatever it is that, you, that occupies your day. Go do that and then come back at the end of the day to a set time and write an additional 1500 words and you're still hitting sort of the 1500 word a day minimum if you at least commit to that morning uh, and you can do that you know that that'll give you a, a 30 day boost there uh, to, to knock out a book but if you're doing it twice a day you do it and you, you write the book in half the time and uh, that gives you the rest of the month you could actually edit you could literally have a book produced and ready to be sold within 30 days if you really uh, focused on it and did it that way uh, if you're only writing weekdays, you know, it does slow you down a little, but you know, that's, it's, it's a variable. So you can actually squeeze more, uh, word count in and, and, and still meet the deadline. So it's up to you how you do it. I find it easier to just get up and knock out, you know, a minimum of a thousand words a day, uh, than to try to cram 3000 words into one session or whatever, but it's all up to you. Um, now I, I do tend to write maybe around 8,000 words to 10,000 words in a session each day. Um, and right now my attention is sort of split because I'm doing not just the books, but blog posts and, um, and other content. So, uh, you know, my total word count per project has gone down, but my total word count per day has gone up dramatically. So, and that's one thing you'll learn as you go that that's possible. Um, the other advice, by the way, is it's not advice, it's a command. See, when you're writing a book, you have one job. You've got one job, one job only, and that is you're the writer. You're not the editor. Don't try to do the editor's job. <laughs> Turn off that inner editor, write without editing yourself. I know how painful it is, but you got to do it. And then when the book is done, you can come back, put on your editor cap, you can, you can edit like crazy and, and go uh, revise and, and rewrite to your heart's content because the book is already there, the story is already there, and all you're doing is cleaning it up. So it's, it's, the, um, it's iterate and optimize. I mean, th those are the two key words you got to remember. You're iterating a book day by day, and then at the end of that process, you optimize the book. You go through and edit it. Don't do the editor's job and don't do the author's job. At the same time, you, you can't do both. you got to do one or the other. Be the author and then be the editor. Da! I kind of stumbled that. So um, that's it. That's it for this week. Uh, thank you, Brandon, for that question. And also, Josh, for your question about the wordslinger. And if you have a question for me or for the guests, uh, why don't you go to wordslingerpodcast.com where you can leave me a voicemail straight from the site or you can call me at 281-809-WORD. That's 281-809-9673 where you can leave me a voicemail. And I'll play your question on the air and answer it just like I did for these emails. And, of course, you can email me right from that page. Go, go there, click on the contact button, send me an email with any question you want. So uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Tune in next time. we got more great interviews coming. i got Paul C. Brunson, who is the uh, sort of real world hitch. <laughs> um, and uh, i got more people lined up. You're going you're gonna to love some of the interviews coming up. So. Take care. I, um, I appreciate you tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Wordslinger.